The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life, and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life, that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. reading from 1 John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Can I ask you a 
question Will you tell me the truth Can you bring resurrection I have so little proof Oh Jesus Jesus What will you make of me Trust your intentions when you call me your child, cause I'm here in the tension between pure and defiled, oh Jesus, Jesus, what will you make of me? Love and we're God's children now. We will be transformed somehow. With hope sustained and grace and doubt so far. We're becoming who we are. Down we fell till you sought us. Like some sad house of cards Did it hurt when you caught us? Cause we're all jagged shards Oh Jesus This is the Holy Gospel, according to Luke, the 24th chapter. 
Jesus himself came and stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead and on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power, from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's important to know where you are in the story, to make sense of the whole thing. It's important to understand what a whole story means to know where any one part of it fits. It can, it can radically reshape how you've heard everything that comes before if all of a sudden the ending throws everything else into question. Um, okay, classic example. There was a Bible commentary that was on TV every week on Thursdays uh, for a long time in the 1990s. You might not have realized it was a commentary uh, on the Bible, or at least some episodes, where it was a TV show called Friends, that really, really immensely popular sitcom about six people in New York City who were friends. That's why it was called Friends. There was this episode uh, where one of the characters who was um, particularly sort of uh, goofy and eclectic in a, in a fun sort of way, uh, it was the character played by Lisa Kudrow, her name was Phoebe. There was an episode where they're talking about classic movies and she talks about how much she loves that feel-good classic romp old yeller because she loves how it's about nothing but a boy playing with his dog. And all the other friends are really surprised that she really, really likes this movie that they all know to have a sad ending. I mean, everybody knows the story of old yeller, right? The, the dog uh, who gets uh, raised by this family and he takes care of them as they're out in the wilderness. But toward the end of the movie, Old Yeller gets bit, gets rabies, and they have to shoot Old Yeller. They have to put Old Yeller down. Spoiler alert, this movie is plenty old. You've had your chance to see it. But, of course, that's part of the, the, the joke of this episode of the TV show. The character, Phoebe, hasn't seen it all the way through. All she's ever seen is the first half of the movie. And so she thinks the movie is nothing but joyful, playful romps about a boy and his dog where nothing sad happens. And she talks about how much she loves when she's in a sad mood to watch Old Yeller because it's such a happy movie because she's only ever made it through the first half of the movie. Conversely, there's another bit on the joke by the end of the movie where she talks about what a terrible and sad movie that Jimmy Stewart classic that everybody's talking about, It's a Wonderful Life, is and how dour and sad it is because, again, she's only ever made it through the first half of the movie. And as residents of Indiana County, Pennsylvania, hometown of Jimmy Stewart, know... The first half of that movie is awfully sad, right? It's all about Jimmy Stewart's character wanting to, to kill himself because he, he feels like his life isn't worth anything at all, and he watches his family and uh, community and the economy crumble and feels like, boy, it's been a big old mistake for his whole life, and then he gets to see terrible things happening um, if he had never been born. It's only at the end of the movie when he realizes he does want to live and there's a happy ending as only celluloid can deliver with everybody back to normal, everything put right, and even Clarence the Angel getting his wings as the bells ring in the background, right? That's a classic Frank Capra happy ending, but if all you've ever seen is the first half of the movie, 
you might think the lesson, the story or the point of a movie like It's a Wonderful Life is don't ever care about other people because it will always backfire on you or the bad guys always get away with their crookedness. If all you've ever seen is part of the story, you don't really know what the story's about. You may have seen the first half of the story. You might have read the first half of the book, but everything changes. Even with things you have seen before change what they mean if the ending throws everything into a different light. I'm going to venture one more potential spoiler, again, from the 1990s. So you've had a good long while to see this movie. There was a, a movie with a, a, a huge, huge blockbuster twist that came out in the 1990s, The Sixth Sense. Um, and I won't spoil the ending, but as you watch the movie go along about this boy who believes he can see dead people, and then the big reveal is uh, shown um, almost toward the end of the movie, it changes the meaning of everything else you've seen. In fact, sometimes the movie will flash back and show you things you had seen in the first part of the movie, and now you understand them in a totally different light because of the big twist, the big reveal that happens toward the end of the movie. Movie makers do that intentionally sometimes to jar us out of place and help us to see the world, both the world of their movies and the stories they're telling, and maybe the world that we live in in a different light. And I want to suggest what Jesus does for his disciples when he appears there in the room they are locked inside because they are afraid. What Jesus does by appearing and not just showing them that he's alive again, but opening them to the scriptures is about re-centering what the story, God's story, is all about. We have this way. We who own Bibles that all come in uh, one set of faux leather covers like this, we sort of have this assumption that everybody knows how the story goes and everybody agrees on what the point of the story is, but once we start actually talking with each other, or much less talking with people who don't have a whole lot of familiarity with the story, we end up with very, very different conclusions. There are, there's folks, well-meaning, respectable religious folks, who are convinced the primary point of this book, of the story we call the Holy Bible or the Scriptures, the point is here's a bunch of rules that if you follow them well enough, then you can earn your way into the Heaven Club. Or, in a similar version, um, here's a list of facts you're supposed to believe about God. If you believe them well enough, then you get into the the Heaven Club. Others sort of see this as a story of um, the empires come and go and they just sort of womp on God's people and there's no hope at the end. I mean, honestly, if you read uh, what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, it ends with an awful lot of expectation that things will get put right, but it's a pretty sad ending because it feels like the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Greeks and the Romans have all come whomping on God's people while they are hoping for restoration. And if the story ends there, my goodness, that's like watching the first half of It's a Wonderful Life and then turning it off and never finding out if George Bailey decides he wants to live again and what happens to Clarence and his wings. Others take a look at the story of the scriptures and assume that in the end, God defeats the powers of evil on the same terms as all those other world empires. In the end, eventually, after Rome has had its turn and Greece has had its turn and all the rest of history's empires have had their turns, that God will finally destroy all the evil people with a cosmic battle and that God's victory is eventually one of violence and killing as well. It's possible to read the story that way too, I suppose. But what Jesus does when he comes amidst his disciples there on that very first Easter day. It's getting pretty late in the day. It's been a full day for Jesus. There in that room, Jesus helps his followers to re-understand not just the meaning of his life's story, but the meaning of the whole of the story of the Scripture. Our, our narrator for this particular scene, Luke, says Jesus opens to them the scriptures and shows them how all throughout the scriptures everything had pointed toward not a conquering army, not a new king who would enforce and, um, uh, and compel people by violence or fear to do what he said. Not a big bully who insisted on greatness by bragging or yelling or shouting but that God would redeem not just his people, but all of creation through suffering, through death, 
and through resurrection. That in the end, God's way to restore all of creation isn't to smash or destroy God's enemies, not to kill them before they kill uh, somebody else, not to, to vanquish the threat preemptively, but to go through the worst we can do to God and then to come through it through a borrowed grave in resurrection. And that changes what kind of story this is. Honestly, it prevents us from misunderstanding the scriptures it's a set of rules you have to follow, and if you're good enough, then you get into the heaven club. It prevents us from mishearing the Bible as a list of, here are the facts you have to believe correctly about God, recite them from memory, and then get into the heaven club after you die. And it also undercuts read, reading the story of Scripture as just one more story of world empires coming and going, and that there's no hope or meaning to any of it. And it rules out in the end that God's way of attaining victory is through smashing or destroying or killing, but instead that God becomes vulnerable and that God's powerful love endures even death, endures our mockery, our ridicule, our anger, our violence, our sin, and then breaks that open into resurrection life. It changes the kind of story this is. That's Critical, Because for Jesus' followers who had grown up reading the scriptures, reading what we call the Old Testament, the, the, the laws and the commandments uh, of Moses and the words of the prophets and the histories of the kings, they grew up hearing those stories. But if you hear those stories expecting that this is the kind of story that ends with and God will fight a battle and raise up an army and kill our enemies, that's how God saves the world, you're, gonna, you're in for a surprise when the Savior, the Messiah, comes along and gets killed by the empire and thereby exposes the empire's power. If you're expecting that the way God reigns in the end is to set up a king and a kingdom and to, to work through uh, political machinery and to depose Rome and to make himself great that way and that we're going to get rid of all the other people who are different and not like us, you're in for a surprise when Jesus comes up on the scene welcomes outsiders and strangers, uplifts women into roles of leadership and prominence, blesses the poor and scatters the proud and takes the arrogant down a few pegs and then says his way of bringing about God's kingdom is through a cross and resurrection, not by crushing his enemies under his feet. That changes the story. Maybe all of us, maybe all of us, even people who've been growing up hearing these Bible stories for our lifetimes, maybe we need to have Jesus show up and help us to rehear the stories again. Because it is so easy to be like Phoebe from Friends. It's so easy to think we know how this story goes. Stop listening and think Old Yeller is a playful child romp because it's all about a boy and his dog and forget to the sad part. Or it's so easy to think that George Bailey is a poor schmuck for helping out his neighbors and you should never help or love anybody because that only leads to sadness and because you stopped It's a Wonderful Life halfway through. Jesus re-centers how the story works. And that changes our view of everything. That means then, as you and I head out into our lives in this week, our job isn't to be the ones fighting God's battle to ensure God's victory. The victory's already accomplished. It's a done deal. Jesus says to his disciples, this is what the whole plan was all along, cross and resurrection. That's how God wins victory. So our job isn't that if I'm strong enough or valiant enough or noble enough or just tough enough, I can win the battle for God or I can, I can make things happen the way God wants them to be. Our job isn't to fight some battle for God. God's already done the fighting and God's way of fighting looks like a cross. There is no alternative plan where God smashes or destroys or kills. It's instead God bears our rottenness through a cross and breaks its power by absorbing the poison, so to speak, and then rising into new life. So our job isn't to fight some culture war, despite the voices of lots of respectable religious people. Our job isn't to get people all fussy or riled up about things. Our job is not to just say and shout angry things on social media or to our neighbors. Jesus puts our calling very simply. You are my witnesses. 
You're the people who know how the story goes and know how to tell it rightly. The, the story of God's love for the world isn't ultimately a tragedy. It doesn't end in the world being lost and it doesn't end in God being defeated either by the powers of the day. It's a divine comedy. It's about a God whose love does the unexpected and absorbs the worst we can do even to a cross and a borrowed grave and breaks that power open in resurrection. It's about a God who doesn't use the means the world assumes power comes in. God doesn't use armies or weapons or wealth for that matter but comes in the face of a homeless, barefoot rabbi. And our work, then, is to tell one another, this is the good news, this is how God's reign works and looks. God has already achieved the victory. It's not up to us and our attempts to be tough enough or strong, but God has achieved the victory. And to help one another, folks who are already part of this thing called church and folks who've never heard, to hear how the story really goes. This isn't a story of might making right and crushing one's enemies. It's about a love that embraces even enemies and reconciles them through a cross. This week, then, your job is not to look tough or powerful or to intimidate anybody else in the name of religiosity, but to be a witness, to tell the story about how God's love shows up in scars and in weakness and in broken places and to point people toward that kind of a hope. In the end, this story is both one where the main character goes all the way to death, so I guess like watching Old Yeller all the way through, but also one of deep redemption and of hope, like watching It's a Wonderful Life all the way through. Jesus is the one who helps us understand how the story actually goes, how our life stories actually go, and reminds us that wherever you are in this moment, you're not at the end of your life story. So whatever you think your life story means, we're not there to the end. We're not at the end of the story. There's more yet to be told. And Jesus is the one who helps us re-understand, re-center what the meaning of all the universe's story is as well. And that in the end, it's not the story of King of the Hill, of one bully pushing off other bullies from the top of the heap um, until everybody is vanquished. But our story is a God who reigns from a cross on, an, on a hill far away, as the old hymn puts it. Today, and maybe every day then, let's allow Jesus, let's invite Jesus in, right where we are, to tell us the stories we think we've heard before, and to tell them in a way that helps us to see the cross and resurrection at the center of our life stories, of his story, and of all the universe's story. That's what makes this a good ending after all.
Together, let us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Transformed by the life-giving power of the empty tomb, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all those in need. Each part of our prayers today will end with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and you're invited to respond, hear our prayer. Sent forth as witnesses to the resurrection, we ask, O oh God, that you would make us your people in the church to boldly proclaim the message of repentance and forgiveness to all nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sent forth as stewards of your creation, O oh God, we ask that you would give us wisdom and knowledge to use the earth's resources with grace, with generosity, with prudence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sent forth as peacemakers in a world of conflict, we pray, O oh God, for all who work for cooperation and reconciliation among nations, communities, and within families. In cities, in towns, in neighborhoods where there is turmoil, bring justice. Protect those who are most vulnerable and bless those who are oppressed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sent forth as healers and caretakers, we pray for capable minds and compassionate hearts to attend to all who are in pain, all who suffer, and all who are afraid. We ask for your blessing and strength on doctors, nurses, health care workers, personal care and nursing home attendants, those who are administering vaccines, those who work in laboratories, those who are working to bring healing to others with all kinds of sickness in the midst of a pandemic, those whose lives and livelihoods are endangered in these days, those who are sick in body, in mind, and in spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sent forth as children of God to teach and to guide, we pray, O oh God, for the young, for those who are new to the faith, for the teaching ministries of this congregation and of your church in all places. Give us resilience and energy, creativity and vision to reach people of all ages with your good news and with teaching on how to follow the way of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sent forth to love and to serve, we give thanks for those who have gone before us faithfully carrying out Christ's mission, that to the end we would all be clothed with them with power from on high. Help us as we seek to walk in their footsteps as they follow in the footsteps of Jesus himself, that we might be faithful witnesses for those who come after us, and that in time all of us will be gathered in your new creation in the resurrection feast which has no end. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. Hear our prayers, gracious God, and grant that all we need to live as your spirit-filled people you will give us as we trust and commend ourselves and those whom we love into your wounded but risen hands. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let us pray boldly in the words Jesus gave us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. you with favor and give you peace.